Hi, I'm Carla Hayden, the Librarian of Congress, and it is my pleasure to wish you a very happy Children's Book Week. This year marks its 100th anniversary, and the Library of Congress is excited to join the celebration. We are especially excited about the 2019 theme, Read Now, Read Forever, because it looks to the past, present, and the future of children's books, and our celebration aims to do the same. Today, the Library of Congress is launching a new digital collection of children's book selections. This new collection is made up of full-color, digitized versions of dozens of specially selected children's books from our general and rare book collections. Our hope is that these books will be enjoyed equally by children, their parents, and teachers. We've organized the collection into three main categories, learning to read, reading to learn, and reading for fun. To help us connect young readers of today with these historic children's books, we've teamed up with the voices of contemporary creators of children's literature. Local authors who are members of the Children's Book Guild of Washington, D.C. will be reading 20 of these special books to you right here from the Young Reader Center in the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress, starting right now and continuing for the next few hours. As you listen, do keep in mind that every one of these stories that we have selected existed when the first Children's Book Week was celebrated 100 years ago. So get comfortable and put your listening ears on. Here we go. Good morning. Happy Children's Book Week. I'm Leanne Potter, and I direct the Office of Learning and Innovation here at the Library of Congress, and I get the pleasure of reading our first story. The book I have for us is entitled The Juvenile National Calendar. It was published in 1824, and it is a much more interesting book than its title might imply. It actually has a subtitle. It was not just The Juvenile National Calendar. It was called The Juvenile National Calendar, or a familiar description of the U.S. government. With hand-colored illustrations and amusing verses, it describes the role of the people, of the president, the vice president, the cabinet members, and congressmen in 1824, when the United States was less than 50 years old. It engages young citizens and teaches them about the workings of their government. And it begins, the rising generation. Come all my young pupils, stand round in a ring, and listen to me while I merrily sing. I will tell you of those who enjoy the command, which is held o'er all of us, for the good of the land. Of the president, cabinet, congressman too, I mean to describe and bring into view, who by learning and virtue their honors did get, so that you, if you're good, may be presidents yet, the people. But first of the people, my song must relate that they choose for themselves who shall govern the state. And each of the men who are aged 21 has a right to cry out what he wants to be done and meet with his neighbors, some friends to elect, to rule over the land and whom all may respect. And he for whom most of the people may shout is placed as a ruler until his turns out. President of the US. Of the president next, you will hear me declare that although neither silver nor gold does he wear, and like you may be punished if he e'er acts wrong, yet to him does much power and importance belong. He ambassadors sends to the nations afar he is chief of the soldiers who fight in the war. He may pardon the convict of hanging in fear, and he gets $25,000 a year. The vice president. Next to him, the vice president ranks in the land with one-fifth of the pay and a smaller command. As chief of the Senate, of right he presides, and his vote, when the others are equal, decides. If the president dies, sir, his place he must take until the good people another can make. Their stations they hold for a term of four years, after which, as a citizen, each one 
appears. The Secretary of State. But the President chooses a council for aid, before which the affairs of importance are laid. The first has an eye or all matters of state, and on him all the foreign ambassadors wait. The Turk and the Dutchman and Russian so gain bow down to the floor in the presence of him. And $6,000 is what we must give to enable this one of the council to live. Secretary of the Treasury. The task of the next is to watch o'er the gold and the keys of the chests which enclose it to hold, to keep an account how the money all went and to tell the good people how much they have spent. And by turning and twisting his thoughts in his brain, to hit on a method to get more gain. And to pay for this trouble in guarding our store, we give him the same as the others before. Secretary of the Navy. The next or the Navy that boast of our land or its sailors and officers holds its command. He tells to what regions the vessels must sail or bids them repose in the port from the gale. He signs the commissions which office to bestow on those who on ocean must vanquish the foe. Though he rules on the sea yet lives on the shore and receives what we gave the others before the Secretary of War, or the army, the next of the council presides, for its wants and its comforts, tis he that provides. When war is declared, he gives orders to march to the soldiers well stiffened with buckram and starch, and forward they rush at the word of command to bleed or die for the good of the land. The lawyer for all, we must add to this yet, and now we've completed the whole cabinet going to Congress. The congressman next our attention demands. Some are chosen for merit and some for their lands. As the people can't meet altogether, you know, they choose from their body some few that shall go. And he who is anxious to help make laws works hardest and longest for public applause. Till chosen, he bids them a gracious goodbye and the pleasure of going is bright in his eye the member of Congress. Next in Congress, as we hear his speeches declaim, give honor to one, to another give blame. Demand what he thinks is of use to his friends with a candor and freedom that never offends. As long as he can, he is willing to stay, for he gets for his trouble $8 a day. And when all his toil and labor is over, contented returns to his station before. And finally, General Lafayette. Thus far I have sung of our country and laws, but still there's another who claims your applause, whose blood for our freedom once freely did flow, who at Yorktown and Brandywine vanquished the foe, and returns when the summer of manhood is gone to the homage of hearts which are wholly his own. His name? You shall hear it and never forget the friend of America, brave Lafayette. Thank you. Happy Children's Book Week. Walter Crane illustrates these timeless fables and morals credited to Aesop, a Greek storyteller who lived in the 5th century BCE. Originally, the fables were not written down, but only spoken aloud. The fables and their lessons continue to be interpreted anew by illustrators and storytellers in each generation. In Baby's Own Aesop, Walter Crane condenses each of 56 fables to brief and entertaining rhymes with the attendant morals and illustrates them in his vibrant style. Notice his mark in each illustration, a large C surrounding a W and a stick figure crane. Baby's Own Aesop. Being the fables condensed in rhyme, 
with portable morals pictorially pointed by Walter Crane. And those of you who are poetry fans will notice that these morals, uh, these fables are written in limerick form. The Cock and the Pearl. A rooster, while scratching for grain, found a pearl. He just paused to explain that a jewel's no good to a fowl wanting food, and then kicked it aside with disdain. And the moral is, if he ask bread, will ye give him a stone? The wolf and the lamb. A wolf, wanting lamb for his dinner, growled out, Lamb, you wronged me, you sinner. Bleated lamb, nay, not true, answered wolf. Then twas you, you or lamb, you will serve for my dinner. Fraud and violence have no scruples. The wind and the sun. The wind and the sun had a bet. The wayfarer's cloak, which should get? Blew the wind, the cloak clung. Shone the sun, the cloak flung. Showed the sun had the best of it yet. And the moral is, true strength is not bluster. King Log and King Stork. The frogs prayed to Jove for a king. Not a log, but a livelier thing. Jove sent them a stork who did royal work, for he gobbled them up, did their king. And the moral is, very simply, don't have kings. The frightened lion. A bullfrog, according to rule, sat a croak in his usual pool, and he laughed in his heart as a lion did start in a fright from the brink like a fool. Imaginary fears are the worst. The mouse and the lion. A poor thing, the mouse. I'm starting this one over. The mouse and the lion. A poor thing the mouse was, and yet, when the lion got caught in a net, all his strength was no use. Twas the poor little mouse who nibbled him out of the net. Small causes may produce great results. And the next one is a big favorite here, the married mouse. So, the mouse had a lion for bride. Very great was his joy and his pride, but it chanced that she put on her husband her foot, and the weight was too much, so he died. One may be too ambitious, and if you look closely at the illustration, poor little mouse is lying there, dead. The next one is Hercules and the Wagoner. When the gods saw the Wagoner kneel, crying, Hercules, lift me my wheel from the mud where tis stuck, he laughed, no such luck. Set your shoulder yourself to the wheel. The gods help those who help themselves. The lazy housemaids. Two maids killed the rooster, whose warning awoke them too soon every morning. But small were their gains, for their mistress took pains to rouse them herself without warning. And the moral is, laziness is its own punishment. The snake and the file. A snake in a fix tried a file for dinner. Tis not worth your while, said the steel. Don't mistake, I'm accustomed to take, to gives not the way of a file. We may meet our match. Said sly fox to the crow. Oh, I forgot the title on that one. Let's go back. The fox and the crow. Said sly fox to the crow with the cheese. Let me hear your sweet voice now, do please. And this crow being weak, cawed the bit from her beak. Music charms, said the fox, and here's cheese. Beware of flatterers. The dog in the manger. A cow sought a mouthful of hay, but a dog in the manger there lay, and he snapped out, how now? When most mildly, the cow adventured a morsel to prey. Don't be selfish. The frog and the bull. Said the frog, quite puffed up to the eyes, was this bull about me as to size? Rather bigger, frog brother. Puff, puff, 
said the other. A frog is a bull if he tries. But brag is not always belief. The fox and the crane. You have heard how Sir Fox treated Crane with a soup plate in a plate. When again they dined, a long bottle just suited Crane's th throttle, and Sir Fox licked the outside in vain. There are games that two can play. Horse and man. When the horse first took man on his back to help him the stag to attack, how little his dread as the enemy fled, man would make him his slave and his hack. Advantages may be dearly bought. The ass and the enemy. Get up, let us flee from the foe, said the man. But the ass said, why so? Will they double my load or my blows? Then by goad and by stirrup, I've no cause to go. Your reasons are not mine. The fox and the mosquitoes. Being plagued with mosquitoes one day, said old fox, pray don't send them away, for a hungrier swarm would work me more harm. I had rather the full ones should stay. And the moral of this one is, there were politicians in Aesop's time. The fox and the lion. The first time the fox had a sight of the lion, he most died of fright. When he next met his eye, Fox felt just a bit shy, but the next quite at ease and polite. Familiarity destroys fear. The miser and his gold. He buried his gold in a hole. One saw, and the treasure he stole. Said another, what matter? Don't raise such a clatter. You can still go and sit by the hole. Use alone gives value. The golden eggs. A golden egg won every day, that simpleton's goose used to lay. So he killed the poor thing, swifter fortune to bring, and dined off his fortune that day. Greed overreaches itself. And the last fable for now, the man that pleased none. Through the town, this good man and his son strove to ride as to please everyone. Self, son, or both tried, then the ass had a ride, while the world at their efforts poked fun. You cannot hope to please all. Don't try. Thanks, everybody. I'm excited to be with you for Children's Book Week. Uh, Read Now, Read Forever gives today's authors, like myself, a chance to celebrate classic books and stories that were meaningful to us as children and young readers. So happy Children's Book Week, and thanks. Good morning. My name is Michelle Y. Green. I'm the author of A Strong Right Arm, the story of Mamie Peanut Johnson, and a series, a historical fiction series called Billy Pearl. The Little Pretty Pocket Book was published in 1787. The caption under the frontispiece of this significant piece of early American children literature reads, Instruction with Delight. This title, probably more than any other, marks the point at which American children's literature turns from overwhelmingly instructional to being entertaining as well. In 1787, when this book was printed, society had very strict ideas of what should be entertaining for children, and even an invitation to play games was accompanied by morals and life lessons, as you will see in the games selected here. A little pretty pocketbook intended for the instruction and amusement of Little Master Tommy and Pretty Miss Polly, with two letters from Jack the Giant Killer. Here we go. The Great G Play. Hop, step, and jump. Hop short and step safe to make your jump long. This art oft has beat the efforts of the strong. And the moral is, this old maxim, take, embellish your book, think well ere you talk, and air you leap. Look. The little G play. Boys and girls come out to play. After a sultry summer's day, when the moon shines and stars are gay, the nymphs and swains well pleased advance and spend the evening in a dance. The rule of life. Reflect today upon the last and freely own thy errors pass. The great H play. 
I sent a letter to my love. The lads and lassies here are seen, all gaily tripping o'er the green. But one among them, to her cost, the treasure of her heart was lost. The rule of life, if prosperous of pride beware, changes of fortune frequent are. The little H play. Pitch and hustle. Poise your hand fairly and pitch plumb your slat and shake for all heads and turn down the hat. The moral is, how fickle this game, so fortune or fate, decrees our repentance when off tis too late. The great I play, cricket. This lesson observe when you play at cricket, catch all fairly out or bowl down the wicket. And the moral is, this maxim regard, now you're in your prime, look ere tis too late, by the forelock, take time. The little eye play. Stool ball. The once, ball once struck with ardent care and drove impetuous through the air. Swift round his course, the gamer flies, or his stool's taken by surprise. The rule of life. Bestow your alms whene'er you flee, an object in necessity. The great K play. Swimming. When the sunbeams have warmed the air, are used to come cool brook repair. In whole refreshing steams, streams they play to the last remnant of the day. The rule of life. Think ere you speak, for words once flown, once uttered, are no more your own. The little K play. Baseball. The ball once struck, off flies the boy. To the next destined plot, and then home with joy. The moral is, thus seamen for lucre fly over the main, but with pleasure transported return back again. The great L play, trap ball. Touch lightly the trap and strike low the ball and none catch you out and you'll beat them all. The moral is, learn hence my dear boy to avoid every share. Contrive to involve you in sorrow and care. The little I play. Tip cat. The gamer here his art displays and drives the cat a thousand ways. For should he miss, once tis tossed, he's out and his sport is lost. Rule of life. Debates and quarrels always shun. No one by peace was e'er undone. The great in play. Fives. With what great force this little ball rebounds when struck against the wall. See how intent each gamer stands. Mark well his eyes, his feet, his hands. The rule of life. Know this, which is enough to know. Virtue is happiness below. And that's an excerpt from the little pretty pocketbook. Do you believe in dreams? I do. When my mother was very young, her name is Willie Pearl, she lived in the faraway Misty Mountains in a little town called Jenkins, Kentucky. She had a teacher who would read to her every day from fairy tales. And one day, Willie Pearl, who came from a poor family with a lot of moral values, decided that she wanted to see the castles far, far away. Once upon a time, there was a little boy. His name was Frex. Eddie Lee Young, he was my father, and he lived in the Misty Mountains far away in Jenkins too, about a mile away from where my mother lived. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Michelle, and she lived with her mother and father, and she went to Germany. And in the fifth grade, she had a teacher, Miss Rowell, that used to talk to her every day and speak to her and read to the class about Little House on the Prairie. And Michelle grew up knowing that she wanted to be an author. And what do they all have in common? They all had dreams. Well, Willie Pearl and Eddie Lee Young got married. Uh, 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 my father went down to Tuskegee, and there he became a pilot, and I'm wearing his wings. The two of them got married, had three daughters. We moved to Germany. And believe it or not, Willie Pearl saw all the castles on the Rhine. She saw gondolas. She saw England. She saw all of Europe and we had a wonderful time. The moral of our story is read, read everything that you can, and if you can't read, find someone to read to you. It's the best adventure in all of the world. Thank you very much, I'm pleased to be here today, and happy Children's Book Week. Good morning. 
My name is Lulu del Acre. I am the author illustrator of Olinguito de la Ala Z, Descubriendo el Bosque Nublado, Olinguito from A to Z, Unveiling the Cloud Forest. Today, I will be reading Little Red Riding Hood, published in 1863. It's a tale that is well known in many countries. Being from Puerto Rico, I know the Spanish version, Caperucita Roja. I always cheered when Caperucita escaped El Lobo Feroz. This 1863 retelling of Little Red Riding Hood is in verse. In, it's both a book and a paper doll being cut in the shape of Little Red herself with the wolf subdued at her feet. There was a lonely cabin within a dark old wood, and in it with her mother there dwelt Red Riding Hood. The tall old trees above them their winter fire supplied when autumn's flaming sunsets from their red leaves had died. The rippling brook their water from far off mountains brought, and prattle of their summits, and in icy statues wrought. For them the squirrels hoarded their nuts in hollow trees, and pounds of sweetest honey were made by the bees. To gather these together was work enough to do. Little Red Riding Hood thought so, and no doubt would you. Blushing beneath her fingers, looked up the berries red. The flowers seemed to know her and listen for her tread. This little pot of butter I've churned so nice and sweet, and mind not stop and prattle with anyone you meet. Then through the shady forest the little maiden went, and Though her steps were fleetest, the day was well nigh spent. When nearly through her journey an old gaunt wolf she spied, who wagged his tail and humbly came walking by her side. Ah, said my little maiden, how fair you are. You really look quite handsome. Where do you walk so far? Forgetful of her mother, she stopped and told him where. <gasps> then she said, then said the wolf, so cunning, what is it that you bear? Forgetful of her mother, she stood and told him what? Tis butter for my grandma, but nicely in this pot. Then said the wolf, goodbye dear, perhaps we'll meet again. Then swiftly as he hastened, swiftly through dale and glen, and running reached before her, the cabin gray and old, her grandmama was absent, he quickly did unfold. Himself in cap and nightgown, then quickly on the bed, closely upon the pillow he laid his grisly head. Red Riding Hood soon entered. Oh, Grandmama, see here, a little pot of butter. Where is my grandma, dear? Here, said the wolf, well feigning her grandma's voice so weak. I'm here so sick, my darling, that I can scarcely speak. Take off your clothes, my darling. Upon the bed, come lie. When you are here beside me, I'll be better by and by. Red Riding Hood obeyed her and got upon the bed. Oh, Grandmama, how altered you are, she quickly said. Oh, what great eyes, my Grandmama. They never looked so before. That's to see you better, my darling. The larger to see you more. What a great nose, my grandma. I never looked so before. That's to smell you better, my darling. The larger to smell you more. And what great hands, my grandma. They never looked so before. 
That's to hold you tight, my darling, and to hug you more and more. What a great mouth, my grandma, as large as your tin cup. That's to open wide, my beauty, and then to eat you up. Then he opened his great mouth wider to eat her like a bird. But at the dreadful moment, a hunter's gun was heard. The wolf fell dead and bleeding. Then Grandma hastened in, for she had seen the peril, her danger that had been. Red Riding Hood wept sadly and sorrowed more and more that she disobeyed her mother, which she never did before. And she thought with, her, with fear and trembling of the death that came so near. And she said the fright had taught her to mind her mother dear. Then listen, you old children, and mom your mother's, mind your mother's word, for the great wolf, men call evil, is prowling, worn, is prowling round on her. Today, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of Children's Book Week. We celebrate enduring books and new books. For me, enduring books bring us the comfort of familiarity with themes that speak to us through the ages. And new books bring the excitement of the discovery of worlds and feelings not known before. Today, new books also bring the power of representation. When the reader sees that the hero of a story mirrors her appearance and life experiences, the child feels empowered and included. Muchas gracias y sigue leyendo. My name is Karen Deans. I'm the author of Swing Sisters, the story of the international sweethearts of rhythm. Today I'm going to be reading The Cat's Party, which was published in 1871. McLaughlin Brothers was a New York publishing firm in the second half of the 19th century and a pioneer in color printing for children. Their books are often retellings of tales and amusing stories in inexpensive formats. In The Cat's Party, some very well-dressed and polite cats get invited to a party that doesn't go all too well. The Cat's Party. Mrs. Grimalkin writes her cards. Make Mistress Grimalkin so fat and so hearty, once gave to her kittens a nice little party. She sent out her cards with gilt edges bound, for the tortoise shells, tabbies, and blacks to come round. There was uncle and aunt, and some cats of first water. Of course not forgetting her last married daughter. There was mother and sister besides her first cousin. Counting heads as they sat, they made up a dozen. Mrs. G determines to borrow her mistress's dishes. The next thing to be done was to make preparation. So the kittens were called to hold consultation. Quoth Mrs. G, I've determined from mistress to borrow all the dishes we need and return them tomorrow. We'll have crumpets and muffins and nice buttered toast, shrimps and fried fish, and some meat which we'll roast. There's nothing like fish, though we're plenty beside. I could eat a large plateful, especially fried. The table groans and Tom runs away. The day was quite fine, the weather propitious. So they spread out the things which appeared so delicious. They had so much on the table that a tomcat declared, it certainly groaned and he ran away scared. The guests now arriving, they each took a seat, some suspiciously eyeing the fish and the meat. It having been hinted, twas not all quite fresh. They each begun thinking they were caught in a mesh. 
they are desired to make themselves at home. Mrs. Evans was dressed in her best bib and tucker. This quarrelsome cat often got in a pucker. And though Tom was handsome, he'd much cause to wail, being hurt by the door to on his tail. But all went on smoothly, for each did their best to do all they could to please all the rest. And they made themselves happy as good kittens ought, though of all the nice things, not one had been bought. Mrs. G's marked politeness to her old friend Thomas. Then Madam Grimalkin, though oft she did roam, said, I hope you with all make yourselves quite at home. As mistress do don't look very close to her store, there is plenty of everything. Tom, take some more. Yes, dear Miss Grimalkin, now look at this dish and permit me to send you a piece of fried fish. I thank you, dear Tom, if your appetite's keen, Here's a cup of the very best milk ever seen. Billy and the Bellows. Such politeness from old and young feline shoots has seldom been seen since the famed Puss in Boots. But Billy, who wore a great brown shining coat, got a dreadful large herringbone stuck in his throat. Then he kicked and meowed with all force he was able and finally turned upside down the great table when his friend Mrs. Evans, of him being jealous, coolly thrust down his throat the nose of the bellows. The dance. Such roughness, such kindness, at length moved the bone, and poor Billy recovered himself very soon, when a ladylike cat, who had visited France, after supper proposed they should all have a dance. Tom and her ladyship now opened the ball, and merrily danced to the delight of them all. The others soon followed till all in the room were dancing away as though quite at home. Sudden appearance of Mrs. In the midst of the dancing, the mistress came in, completely astonished to hear such a din. She struck the ringleader, which so frightened the rest that to get out of sight, they each did their best. And the moral of the story is, a saying there is, perhaps not known to all, and to it the attention of every good cat I call. It's something about taking what isn't hisn, and the saying winds up with he shall go to prison. So all cats and kittens from us take advice, and never still viands, though ever so nice. Leave your feelings be hurt by this candid illusion, and like Tom and the rest of them, put to confusion. Here's to a wonderful life of reading and storytelling. Happy Children's Book Week. My name is Rhoda Tuboff, and I am a children's book publisher here in Washington, D.C. at a very small children's book press called Tenley Circle Press. Today I'm going to be reading to you Yankee Doodle, an old song in a new dress by Howard Pyle, published in 1881. Howard Pyle offers a youngster's view of war, specifically the American Revolution, its troops, and ordnance. Writing and illustrating at the same time as the three British masters Caldecott, Crane, and Greenaway, Pyle is known by many as the father of American children's book illustration. His talent for creating illustrations that go beyond the simple characterization of the story is on full view in this work. Yankee Doodle, an old song, an old friend, in a new dress. Father and I went down to camp, along with Captain Goodwin, where we see the men and boys as thick as hasty pudding. There was Captain Washington upon a slapping stallion, a giving orders to his men. I guess there was a million. And then the feathers in his hat, 
They looked so tarnal fina. I wanted pescally to get to give to my Jemima. And then they had a swamp and gun as big as a log of maple on a deuced little cart, a load for father's cattle. And every time they fired it off, it took a horn of powder. It made a noise like father's gun, only a nation louder. I went as near it, I went as near to it myself as Jacob's underpinning, and father went as near again. I thought the deuce was in him. Cousin Simon grew so bold, I thought he would have cooked. I, sorry. Cousin Simon grew so bold, I thought he would have cocked it. It scared me, so I shrinked off and hunged, hung by father's pocket. And there I see a pumpkin shell as big as mother's basin. And every time they touched it off, they scampered like the nation. And there I see a little keg. Its heads were made of leather. They knocked upon it with little sticks to call the folks together. And then they'd fife away like fun and play on cornstalk fiddles. And some had ribbons red as blood all wound about their middles. The troopers, too, would gallop up and fire right in our faces. It scared me almost half to death to see them run such races. Old Uncle Sam come then to change some pancakes and some onions. Good fresh pancakes and inures for sale at one halfpenny apiece. for Lass's cake to carry home to give his wife and young'uns. I see another snarl of men, a digging graves, they told me, so tarnal long, so tarnal deep, they tended they should hold me. It scared me so, I hooked it off, nor slept, as I remember, nor turned about till I got home locked up in mother's chamber. The end. Happy Children's Book Week. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My life has been bookended by books and libraries. When I was about seven years old, I got my first job in this little town off the coast of Quincy, Massachusetts. The librarian, Edna Curtis, invited me to be her library page. My job was to go to the, the children's bookshelf, the lowest shelf, and put the books in alphabetical order. And also to take Ms. Curtis's ruler and make sure that all the books were one inch in from the edge of the shelf. That's what I did when I was seven or eight years old. And now I'm a children, children's book publisher at Tenley Circle Press, a very, very small children's press. And here I am today in the biggest and greatest library in the world, the Library of Congress. Thank you very much for letting me read to you. Good morning. My name is Amy Hansen. I'm going to be reading Baby's Own Aesop by Walter Crane, and it's published in 1887. Um, the author of Firebird. For the Baby's Own Aesop, Walter Crane illustrated these timeless fables with morals credited to Aesop, a Greek storyteller who lived in the 5th century BCE. Originally, the fables were not written down but only spoken aloud. The fables and their lessons continue to be interpreted anew by illustrators and storytellers in each generation. 
In Baby's Own Aesop, Walter Crane condenses each of the 56 fables to a brief and entertaining rhymes with the attendant morals and illustration, illustrates them in his own vibrant style. Notice his mark with each illustration, a large C surrounded by a W and a stick figure crane. This is part two of Baby's Own Aesop selections that we are reading today. The Oak and the Reeds. Giant oak in his strength and his scoth, scoth on the winds by, I'm sorry, I'll try that again. Giant oak in his strength and his scoth of the winds by the roots was uptorn, but slim reed at his side the fierce gale did outride, since by bending the burden was borne. The moral is bend not break. The fir and the brabble. The fir tree looked down on the brabble. Poor thing, only able to scrabble about on the ground. Just then an ax sound made the fir wish himself be a brabble. Pride of place has its disadvantage. The trees and the woodman. The trees ask the man what he lacks. One bit just to handle my ax. All he asks, well and good, but he cut down the wood. So well does he handle this ax. Give me an inch and I will take a mile, except it says an L. The heart and the vine. The heart and by the hunters pursued, safely hidden the vine till he chewed the sweet tender green and those shaking leaves seen, he was slain by his ingratitude. Spare your benefactors, is the moral there. The man and the snake. In pity he brought the poor snake to be warmed at his fire, a mistake. For the ungrateful thing, wife and children would sting. I have known some as bad as the snake. Beware how you entertain traitors. Always good advice. The fox and the mask. The fox with his foot on the mask thus took the fair semblance to task. You're a real handsome face, but what part of your case and, and your brain is in, good sir? Let me ask. And I can't read them. Moral. <laughs> I'm sorry. The lion and the statue. On a statue, King Lion dis disthroned, showing conquered man, Lion frowned. If Lion, you know, had been sculptor, he'd show Lion rampant and man on the ground. The story depends on the storyteller. The booster, the boaster, sorry. In the house, in the market, in the streets, everywhere his boasting, his feats, till one said with a sneer, let us see it done here. What's so oft done with ease one repeats. The moral is deeds, not words. The vain jackdaw. Fine feathers, Jack thought, make fine fowls. I'll be envied by bats and by owls. But the peacock's proud eyes saw through his disguise, and Jack fled this assembly of fowls. Borrowed plumes are soon discovered, is the moral. The peacock's complaint. We're into peacocks right now, I can tell. The peacock considered it wrong that he had not the nightingale's song. So to Juno he went, and she replied, Be content with thy having, and, thy, and hold thy fool tongue. Do not quarrel with nature. Two crabs. So awkward, so shambling a gait, Mrs. Crab did her daughter berate, who rejoined, it is true, I am backward, but you needed lessons in walking quite late. Look at home. Two jars. 
Never fear, said the brass to the clay, of the two jars that flood bore away. Keep close to my side. But the porcelain replied, I'll be smashed if beside you I stay. Our friends are enemies. Brother and sister. Twin children, the girl she was plain. The brother was handsome and vain. Let him brag of his looks, father said. Mind your books. The best beauty is bred in the brain. Handsome is as handsome does. The fox without a tail. Said fox minus a tail in a trap. My friends, here's a lucky mishap. Give your tails a short lease. But the foxes weren't geese, and none followed the fashion of trap. Yet some fashions have no better reason. The dog in his shadow. His image the dog did not know, or his bone in the pond's painted show. Tethered dog, so he thought, has got more than he ought. So he snapped, and his dinner saw go. Greed is sometimes caught by its own bait. The crow in the pitcher. With cunning old crow got his drink. When twas low in the pitcher, just think. Don't say that he spilled it. With pebbles he filled it till the water rose up to the brink. Use your wits. I like that one. The eagle and the crow. The eagle flew off with a lamb. Then the crow thought to lift an old man. In his eaglish conceit, the wool tangled his feet, and the shepherd laid hold of the sham. Beware of overrating your own powers. The blind doe. A poor half-blind doe, her one eye kept shorewood all danger to spy as she fed by the sea. Poor innocent, she was shot from a boat passing by. Moral is, watch all sides. So thank you for letting me read. I'm very pleased to be here for Children's Book Week and pleased to be among all these extraordinary books. I will be happy to come back next year. Thank you. Hello, I'm Karen Leggett Abouraya. I write nonfiction children's picture books. My current book is Malala Yousafzai, Warrior with Words. And since we're going to be reading from a, a book by an illustrator, I want to let you know that these books are illustrated by Susan L. Roth. And she does all her illustrations in cut paper collage. So she cuts lots of little tiny pieces of paper to do her collages. The man we're going to be look, whose illustrations we're going to see today, Randolph Caldicott, worked with pen and ink and colors. And, and he was doing this, his energetic and often humorous illustrations, fill a collection of 16 picture books. And the Caldicott Award is named for him. This is the American Library Association's annual award to the artist of the most distinguished American picture book for children. And it's named for this beloved 19th century British illustrator. And this is a book of nursery rhymes and silly verses. And I want you to take a particularly close look at the children that he draws because you'll get an idea of how children dressed in 1887 when this book was published. The first one we're going to read is one you might be familiar with because it's a nursery rhyme we, we still tell sometimes in, in schools and at homes, hey diddle diddle, hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle. And you see some of the pictures are in color and look at the different, look at the characters in there because he's going to mention all of these characters. The cow jumped over the moon and the little dog laughed to see such fun. And the dish ran away with the spoon. Now the next one we're going to read is a frog he would a wooing go. Now a wooing is a, is a phrase that everybody would have known in 1887. 
it really means that Frog is looking for a girlfriend. And, and you'll also see here, there are some phrases here that are, that are nonsense, but they're fun to listen to and they're fun to say, and I'm going to say them on every page. So by the end, you'll be able to say this funny phrase, and it'll get funnier and funnier the more you say it, especially if everybody starts saying it in the family. A frog he would a wooing go, hey ho, says Rowley, whether his mother would let him or no. With a Rowley, Powley, gammon, and spinach, hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. So off he set with his opera hat, hey ho, says Rowley, and on his way he met with a rat, with a Rowley, Powley, gammon, and spinach, hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Pray, Mr. Rat, will you go with me, hey ho, says Rowley, pretty Miss Mousy for us to see. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach, hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Now they soon arrived at Mousy's Hall, hey ho, says Rowley, and gave a loud knock and gave a loud call. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach, hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Pray, Miss Mousy, are you within? Hey ho, says Rowley. Oh yes, kind sirs, I'm sitting to spin. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach, hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Pray, Miss Mouse, will you give us some beer? Hey ho, says Rowley, for Froggy and I are fond of good cheer. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach, hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Pray, Mr. Fogg, will you give us a song? Hey ho, says Rowley, but let it be something that's not very long. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach, hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Indeed, Miss Mouse, replied Mr. Frog, hey ho, says Rowley, a cold has made me hoarse as a hog. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach, hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Since you have caught cold, Miss Mousy said, hey ho, says Rowley, I'll sing you a song that I've just made. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach, hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. But while they were all thus merrymaking, hey ho, says Rowley, a cat and her kittens came tumbling in. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach, hey, says Anthony Rowley. The cat, she seized the rat by the crown. Hey ho, says Rowley. The kittens, they pull the little mouse down. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach. Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. This put Mr. Frog in a terrible fright. Hey ho, says Rowley. He took up his hat and he wished them good night. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach. Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. But as Froggy was crossing a silvery brook. Hey ho, says Rowley. A lily white duck came and gobbled him up. Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. So there was an end of one, two, and three. Hey ho, says Rowley. The rat, the mouse, and the little froggy. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach. Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. So it's a funny verse without a very funny ending. But I wish you a happy Children's Book Week, and I hope you enjoy finding some old books maybe with an aunt or a grandmother or somebody in your household has some beautiful old books around, and then enjoy all the new books that are being written and coming out every day, especially at your library. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Barbara Carney Coaston the author of To the Copper Country, Mahala's Journey, a book published by Wayne State University Press. Today I will be reading part one of King Midas from Wonder Book for Boys and Girls by Nathaniel Hawthorne, published in 1893. In Nathaniel Hawthorne's A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys, with 60 designs by Walter Crane, Crane uses his powers of design and color to help Hawthorne retell six Greek myths for a young audience, including the stories of Medusa, King Midas and his Golden Touch, and Pandora's Box. He frames the telling inside a story of a young man telling tales to children at Tanglewood in western Massachusetts. Today we will read about King Midas. Once upon a time, there lived a very rich man and a king besides, whose name was Midas, and he had a little daughter. King Midas was fonder of gold than of anything else in the world. If he loved anything better, 
it was the one little maiden who played so merrily around her father's footstool. But the more Midas loved his daughter, the more did he desire and seek for wealth. He thought that the best thing he could possibly do for this dear child would be to bequeath her the immensest pile of yellow glistening coin that had ever been heaped together since the world was made. Midas could scarcely bear to see or touch any object that was not gold. He made it his custom, therefore, to pass a large portion of every day in a dark and dreary apartment underground at the basement of his palace. It was here that he kept his wealth. Here, after carefully locking the door, he would take a bag of gold coin or a gold cup as big as a wash bowl or a heavy golden bar or a peck measure of gold dust and bring them from the obscure corners of the room into the one bright and narrow sunbeam that fell from the dungeon-like window. And then would he reckon over the coins in the bag, toss up the bar and catch it as it came down, sift the gold dust through his fingers and whisper to himself, O oh Midas, rich King Midas, what a happy man art thou. Midas was enjoying himself in his treasure room one day when looking suddenly up, what should he behold but a young man with a cheerful and ruddy face. He could not help fancying that the smile with which the stranger regarded him had a kind of golden radiance to it. As Midas knew that he had carefully turned the key in the lock and that no mortal strength could possibly break into his treasure room, he concluded that his visitor must be something more than mortal. You are a wealthy friend, man friend Midas, he observed. I have done pretty well, pretty well, answered Midas in a discontented tone. But if one could live a thousand years, he might have time to grow rich. What? exclaimed the stranger. Then you are not satisfied? Midas shook his head. And pray, what would satisfy you? asked the stranger. Midas paused and meditated. Raising his head, he looked the lustrous stranger in the face. Well, Midas, observed his visitor, tell me your wish. It is only this, replied Midas. I wish everything that I touch might be turned to gold. The stranger's smile grew so very broad that it seemed to fill the room like an outburst of the sun, gleaming into a shadowy dell. The golden touch, exclaimed he. You certainly deserve credit, friend Midas, for striking out so brilliant a conception, but you are quite sure that this will satisfy you? How could it fail, said Midas. I ask nothing else to render me perfectly happy. Be it as you wish then, replied the stranger, waving his hand in token of farewell. Tomorrow at sunrise, you will find yourself gifted with the golden touch. Day had hardly peeped over the hills when King Midas was broad awake. The golden touch had come to him with the first sunbeam. Midas started up and ran about the room, grasping at everything that had happened to be in his way. He seized one of the bedposts, and it became immediately a fluted golden pillar. He hurriedly put on his clothes and was enraptured to see himself in a magnificent suit of gold cloth which retained its flexibility and softness, although it burdened him a little with its weight. He drew out his handkerchief, which little Marigold had hemmed for him. That was likewise gold, with the dear child's neat and pretty stitches running all along the border in gold thread. Somehow or other, this last transformation did not quite please King Midas. He would rather that his little daughter's handiwork should have remained just the same as when she climbed his knee and put it into his hand. It is no great matter, nevertheless, said he to himself, very philosophically. We cannot expect any great good without its being accompanied with some small inconvenience. Wise King Midas emerged into the garden. Midas took great pains in going from bush to bush 
and exercised his magic touch until every individual flower and bud, and even the worms at the heart of some of them, were changed to gold. By the time this good work was completed, King Midas was summoned to breakfast. And as the morning air had given him an excellent appetite, he made haste back to the palace. Little Marigold had not yet made her appearance. It was not a great while before he heard her coming along the passageway, crying bitterly. This circumstance surprised him because Marigold was one of the cheerfulest little people whom you would see in a summer's day and hardly shed a thimbleful of tears in a twelve-month. Marigold slowly and disconsolately opened the door, sobbing as if her heart would break. How now, my little lady, cried Midas. Pray, what is the matter with you this bright morning? Marigold held out her hand in which one of the roses which Midas had so recently transmuted. Beautiful, exclaimed her father. Ah, dear father, answered the child. It is not beautiful, but the ugliest flower that ever grew. As soon as I was dressed, I ran into the garden to gather some roses for you. But oh, dear, dear me, such a misfortune. All the beautiful roses that smelled so sweetly and had so many lovely blushes are blighted and spoiled. They are grown quite yellow, as you can see this one, and have no longer any fragrance. What can have been the matter with them? Pray, don't cry about it, said Midas, who was ashamed to confess that he himself had wrought the change which so greatly afflicted her. Sit down and eat your bread and milk. You will find it easy enough to exchange a golden rose like that for an ordinary one which would wither in a day. I don't care for such roses as this, said Marigold, tossing it contemptuously away. It has no smell and the hard petals prick my nose. Hello, my name is Carl Brown. Um, I'm a co-author in uh, three books, one of which you see here, Humans of Blue. Um, I've got to be a co-author in these books through an organization called Shout Mouse Press. And today I'll be reading uh, The Wonder Book for Girls by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And this one is The Golden Touch, a story about King Midas. King Midas took one of the nice little trouts on his plate and touched his tail with his finger. To his horror, it was immediately transmuted from an admirably fried book trout into a goldfish. It was really a metallic fish and looked as if it, it had been cunningly made by the nicest goldsmith in the world. King Midas, just at that moment, would much rather have a real trout in his dish. I don't quite see, thought to himself, how I am to get any breakfast. Here was literally the richest breakfast that could be set for a king, and its very richness made it absolutely good for nothing. The poorest laborer sitting down to his crust of bread and cup of water was far better off than King Midas whose delicate food was really worth its weight in, weight in gold. King Midas began to doubt whether, after all, riches are the one desirable thing in the world, or even the most desirable. Some, so fascinated was, my, was Midas with the glitter of the yellow metal that he would still have refused to give up the golden touch for so paltry a consideration as a breakfast. Nevertheless, so great was his hunger that he groaned aloud. Our pretty Marigold started from her chair and running to Midas threw her arms affectionately about his knees. He bent down and kissed her. My precious Marigold, 
cried he. But Marigold made no answer. Alas, what had he done? The moment the lips of Midas touched Marigold's forehead, a change had taken place. Little Marigold was a human child no longer, but a golden statue. Midas began to wring his hands and bemoan himself and to wish that he were the poorest man in the wide world. If the loss of, his, of all of his wealth might bring back the, f the faintest rose color to his dear child's face while he was in his tumult of despair, he suddenly beheld the same figure which had bestowed on him this disastrous faculty of the golden touch. The stranger's countenance still wore a smile, which seemed to shed a yellow lush, luster all about the room and gleamed on the little marigold's image. And on the other objects that had been transmuted by the touch of Midas. Well, friend Midas, said the stranger, pray how do you succeed with the golden touch? Midas shook his head. I am very miserable, said he. Very miserable indeed, exclaimed the stranger. Have you not anything that your heart desired? Gold is not everything, answered Midas, and I have lost all that my heart really cared for. Ah, so you have made a discovery since yesterday, observed the stranger. Which these two things do you think is really worth the most? The golden touch? or your own little marigold, warm, soft, and loving as she was an hour ago. Oh, my child, my dear child, cried poor Midas, wringing his hands. You are wiser than you were King Midas, said the stranger, looking seriously at him. Tell me now, do you sincerely desire to rid yourself of this golden touch? It is hateful to me, replied Midas. Go then, said the stranger, and plunge into the river that glides past the bottom of your garden. Take likewise a vase of the same water and sprinkle it over any object that you may desire to change back again from gold into his former sub substance. If you do this in, in earnestness and, sinc and sincerity, it may possibly repair the mischief which your avarice has occasioned. Midas lost no time in snatching up a great earthen pitcher and hasting to the riverside. As he scampered along and forced his way through the shrubbery, it was positively marvelous to see, positively marvelous to see how the foul, foul foliage turned yellow before him. <clears throat> as if the autumn had been there and nowhere else. On reaching the river's brink, he plunged headlong in, without waiting so much as to pull off his shoes. As he dipped the pitcher into the water, it gladdened, yeah, it gladdened his very heart to see it change from gold into the same good. Honest earthen vessel which it had been before he touched it. King Midas hastened back to the pilot, hasted back to the palace. The first thing he did was to sprinkle it by handfuls over the golden figure of little Marigold. No sooner did it fall on her than the rosy color came back to her dear, his dear child's face. Marigold did not know what she had been a little golden statue. Nor could she remember anything that had happened since the moment when she ran with outstretched arms to comfort poor King Midas. Her father led little Marigold into the garden where he sprinkled all the remainder of the water over the rose bushes and above five and above 5,000 roses recovered their beautiful bloom. Little Marigold's hair had now a golden, a golden tinge uh, which he had never observed in it before. 
had been transmuted by the effect of his kiss. This change of hue was really an improvement and made Mary Gold's hair richer than in her babyhood. When King Midas had grown quite an old man and used to trout Mary Gold's children on his knee, he was fond of telling them this marvelous story. And then <clears throat> would he stroke their glossy ringlets and tell them that their hair likewise had a rich shade of gold, which they had inherited from their mother. And to tell you the truth, my precious little folks, quoth King Midas, delight delightingly um, trouting the children all the while, ever since that morning, I had hated the very sight of all other gold, save this. That was the reading of uh, Golden Touch, um, a story of King Midas. And um, I think that Children's, uh, Children's Book Week is in, uh, important because it gives uh, young authors like myself the inspiration to create their own piece. Um, I'm delighted and honored and grateful uh, to have read this in front of you all. Um, in the Library of Congress, and I hope to be back soon.